<laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it is true. We can support her. Um, so our theme is, why is Jesus good for you? The question I want to think about with you just for a few moments is this one. What on earth has God been doing? I want to begin by telling a, a personal anecdote, a true story. Um, we live in Rotherham on a main road. It's quite busy. And our next door neighbor is a very feisty, some would say angry individual. Uh, I was just checking whether he was here or not. Uh, I can tell you that there are, we wouldn't possibly say this, but people in our village refer to this gentleman as Bob the Gob. That's his nickname in the village. I don't know if anyone's ever said that to him. Bob's pet hate, uh, he runs his own business and he has a white transit van. And his pet hate is anyone parking anywhere near the end of his drive that is adjacent to our drive. Uh, the, there's been occasions when we've had friends who've come to our house not knowing the rules and we've run down the drive to say, don't park there, Bob will shout at you. So, one day I parked my car slightly awkwardly and had to reverse down the drive and back out temporarily in front of the end of Bob's drive. And it's a very busy morning, there's traffic going, I'm waiting for a gap to go to where I need to go to. And to my horror, I'm trying not to look. <laughs> the gate is open, and Bob is sat in his van, wind, uh, wind, wind, I, I was going to say steering wheel, windmills, uh, steering wheel in hand, looking like he's on the starting blocks of the Grand Prix, and I'm, I'm praying for a gap in the traffic. Then I start to see out the corner of my arms waving. And then to my even greater horror, the door opens and Bob gets out of his van and is marching down his drive towards my car and I can't go anywhere. And in that moment, the adrenaline kicks in. I know he's an angry man. He's, he's a nice fellow, really. But in this moment, <laughs> I'm not sure whether fight or flight is the right response. I decided not to get out of the car, but the window went down. And as Bob marches towards the car, I started, I thought, preemptive strike, I'm going to shout. <laughs> Calm down, mate, there's loads of traffic. He came up to the car, he leaned into the car and said, morning, mate, <laughs> you've got a puncher. <laughs> Sometimes, it is true in life, isn't it, that we can misunderstand and think that people are angry with us when, in fact, that, that he, he was actually being kind, wasn't he? You've got a puncher, mate. Don't drive off with a puncher. I, I think that we can often treat or view God in exactly that. We think that God is Bob the Gop. He's marching down the drive. He's angry. He's waiting for us to trip up and make, make a mistake. And that there is a sense, of course, that God has every right to be angry. I, when, I, when we think about the world, sometimes we don't even live up to our own expectations, don't we? Let alone a good God who made the world. I, I, I think this question, what on earth has God been doing? I want to go back 2,000 years. One of the first missionaries of Christianity, Christianity spread like wildfire around the Mediterranean in the first century. And in answer to this question, what on earth has God been doing? This is what one writer said in a letter to an ancient church. Let's move on. This, this is a, a, a great sentence. In a letter to an ancient church in the Greek city of Corinth, this first century missionary said, what on earth has God been doing? God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. This is a God who could count men's sins against them, my sins, failures, weaknesses, but somehow he's found a way to be kind and loving. What this writer's pointed to, of course, Luke alluded to in his talk, and this will crop up in all the talks I've done this week. This writer's pointing towards the cross 
where Jesus dies a death that he didn't deserve to die in order to put right our relationship with God that was broken. This, this is the great message of Christianity, that Jesus comes to stand in our shoes and take the consequences of our rebellion, sin, guilt, so that we can be forgiven and reconciled to God. That word, reconciliation, is a great word, isn't it? To be brought near, as Luke said. Let me um, just ask two questions, and, and then we'll be done. First of all, when we talk about the cross, I want to ask this question. Is the, is the cross where Jesus died just a great example of heroic love? Or does it actually achieve something? Just a little illustration. This is not a true story. It's not about Bob the Gob. My wife, Jane, isn't here tonight. But imagine me and Jane are walking along the side of one of the rivers in Sheffield, many rivers in Sheffield. And Jane turns to me and she says, Ian, do, do you love me? She, she's very secure. She doesn't often say that. It's just a made-up story. <laughs> and I, I turn to Jane and say, of course I love you. Let me prove it to you. And for the purposes of the story, I can't swim. I can't swim really. But for this, So I, I leap, before she can say Captain Bird's Eye, I leap into the river, and as I'm being swept away, unable to swim, the last thing she sees is my arm as I go into the water and I mouth the words. <laughs> and she, of course, on the riverbank is traumatized because that would be suicidal. That, that, that might be some kind of example of love, but it would be traumatic. If we twist the story around, let's say that Jane fell into the river and not being able to swim, I, I concerned for Jane, I jump in and I manage to push her to the riverbank and then I'm swept away. That would be making a difference, wouldn't it? That would be heroic. Laying down your life to save someone else's. I, I want to say to you, the cross where Jesus died is not some kind of suicidal example of heroic love. It actually achieves reconciliation between a good God and broken, guilty people like you and me. Last question. Um, there's one more slide here. The word gospel is a Christian word, but it wasn't originally. The word gospel literally means good news, and it was used in ancient cultures for like if a battle was won, a herald would stand up and he would... He would proclaim the gospel, the good news. We won the battle. Hooray. A new emperor's been born. Hooray. And when Christians thought, what word can we pick in our culture that sums up our message? And they chose the word gospel. We think of it as a religious word now. It wasn't in the beginning. The reason they chose the word gospel is because something was being proclaimed. Let me read to you just very quickly. We'll close with this. What American author in this book, you can ask me afterwards what it is, right there you can see the difference between Christianity and all other religions, including no religion. Why? Because the essence of other religions, all other religions, is advice. Christianity is essentially news. Other religions say, do this. And you can be right with God. Only Christianity says this has already been done so that you can be right with God. The gospel is not advice. It's good news. What on earth has been God been doing? He's been at work in the person of his son, reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. Thank you.